Bethlehem, expecting child, they searched the inn to find a place for you were coming soon. There was no room for them to stay, so in a manger filled with hay, God's only son was born. Hallelujah. Flocked by night to see this baby wrapped in light. A host of angels led them all to you. It was just as the angel said, You'll find him in a major bed, Emmanuel and Savior. At which you were, your frankincense and golden myrrh, they gave to you and cried out, Hallelujah! 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 drive the nails in you that rugged cross was my cross too still every breath you drew was hallelujah Church. Merry Christmas. We're so glad to have y'all here this evening. And uh, we don't normally do this on Sunday mornings, but we're going to do it tonight. Uh, take a moment, stand up, greet the people around you, say hi to someone you haven't met before, and tell each other uh, something you're most excited for, for either Christmas Eve or Christmas Day. Thank you. 
done. Go ahead. Almond's done. Go ahead. All right. Well, once again, we just want to say uh, thank you for joining us here today. And you can, you can remain standing. We're going to sing some songs. So you guys can, can stand up. And, uh, and we just have this opportunity to, to sing songs uh, in praise of our Savior and to remember not just the birth of a baby being born, this miraculous baby, but uh, to know that this baby uh, was a Savior of the world to save uh, all of us from our sins, to have a redeemed relationship uh, with, our, with our Lord. So let's sing song, songs to that Savior tonight. The first Noel the angels did say was to certain poor shepherds in fields as they lay. In fields where they lay keeping their sheep On a cold winter's night that was so deep Noel, 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 Noel Born is the King of Israel They look it up and saw a star shining in the east beyond and far, and to the earth it gave great light, and so it continued both day and night. No King of Israel Above all powers Above all kings Above all nature And all created things Above all wisdom And all ways of man you were here before the world began above all kingdoms above all thrones above all wonders the world has ever known above all wealth and treasures of the earth there's no way to measure what you're worth. Noel, 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 Noel. Born is the King of Israel. Noel, 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 Noel. Born is the King of Israel. Come, all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. Oh, come ye, oh, come ye to Bethlehem. Come and behold him, born the King of angels. Oh, 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 oh,
It's Christmas Eve, and for the past four weeks, we have been preparing our hearts in the season of Advent. Tonight, we'll light the Christ candle. John 1, 6-13 says, There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness, to bear witness about the light, that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him. Yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. This entire Advent season we have been focusing on Jesus, the reason for the season. Listen to this poem and answer the question, will you be ready when Jesus comes again? Twas the night before Jesus came, and all through the house, not a creature was praying, not one in the house. Their Bibles were laying on the shelf without care, in hopes that Jesus would not come there. The children were dressing to crawl into bed, not once ever kneeling or bowing a head. And mom, in her rocker, with a baby on her lap, was watching the late show while I took a nap. When out of the east there arose such a clatter, I sprang to my feet to see what was the matter. Away to the window I flew like a flash, I tore back the shutters and threw back the sash. And what to my wondering eye should appear but angels proclaiming that Jesus was here. With a light like the sun sending forth a bright ray, I knew in that moment this must be the day. The light of his face made me cover my head. It was Jesus returning, just like he said. And though I possessed worldly wisdom and wealth, I cried when I saw him in spite of myself. In the book of life, which he held in his hand, was written the name of every saved man. He spoke not a word as he searched for my name. And when he said, it's not here, I hung my head in shame. The peoples whose name had been written with love, he gathered to take to his Father above. With all those who were ready, he arose without a sound, while all the rest were left standing around. I fell to my knees, but it was too late. I'd waited too long, thus sealed my fate. I stood and I cried as they rode out of sight. If only I'd been ready tonight. In the words of this poem, the meaning is clear. The coming of Jesus is drawing near. There's only one life, and when comes the last call, we'll find that the Bible was right after all. Well, Merry Christmas Eve, everyone. It's great to have you with us. Uh, I have enjoyed these four weeks leading up to tonight of Advent, and so fun to have different people from Woodbury Community Church reading. Thanks, guys, who read tonight's Advent reading. And uh, so good to see so many of you here tonight. I know that uh, we have family and friends and lots of people in town, people that we don't get to see very often. And thanks for spending part of your Christmas Eve with us. Um, I know that for some of us, Christmas is a time to give and receive gifts. I talked to a few of the kids tonight who were very quick to tell me as they walked into church what they were hoping for for Christmas or what the big gift that mom and dad already let them open on Christmas Eve was for some of them. And uh, it's an exciting time to do that. For some of you, it's more like Christmas Eve is a time to uh, just rejoice that you get to be with grandchildren or with children or with moms or dads that you don't get to see a whole lot at any other time of year and to be reunited as a family or to be reunited with loved ones. For some of you, um, Christmas isn't a great time of year. Maybe tonight is a time that you you kind of face these days with a little bit of trepidation. Maybe you're missing someone this Christmas that you've lost, and uh, this is a little bit of a hard Christmas. Or maybe you've just had a hard year, and you look at 2015, and you're really glad that in about 10 days we get to turn the calendar to a new year because 2015 has been rough, and you're hoping that 2016 is a little bit of a better year. And I just want you to know we love you, and we're praying for you tonight no matter where you're at. Um, This is a place that you matter. Uh, We care so deeply about you, and I don't want you to have to ever feel like you're, you're leaving this place um, 
and, um, and there, there aren't people that care. And if you're at a spot where you're hurting tonight, we'll spend as much time as we need to on Christmas Eve to hang out with you afterwards and would love to hear your story and interact with you. Christmas has always been about, though, and it is ultimately about Jesus Christ. 2,000 years ago, about 2,000 years ago, a little baby was born in a manger in Bethlehem, uh, just about six miles outside of Jerusalem, and his birth absolutely changed the world. Back in the year 1809, our world was facing some uncertain times. In fact, a lot of people would say that 1809 looks a little bit like 2015. There was terrorism that was going on. Depending on what side of the wars you were on, you felt like you were uh, being abused by maybe some superpowers. Napoleon was working his way, particularly across Austria in that year. Sweden was in an uproar. There was a war that was going on with Russia, and it wasn't going well for the Swedes. In fact, they deposed their king in 1809. There was a coup that uh, took the king out of power, and he was eventually... um, exiled away from his country. Here in the United States, Thomas Jefferson finished his term as president, and a new president named James Monroe came into power. And Jefferson was so popular with the people, and there were people who were worried about what life was going to be like under the new president. It was a day and age where wars and rumors of wars, where coups and presidential successors and day-to-day life was going on. And in 1809, like in the year 2015, the world was paying attention to the headlines, but not paying a whole lot of attention to the babies who were being born in the cradles of England and America. But 1809 was a spectacular year for births. There were some amazing people who were born that year. For example, William Gladstone was born that year. He was destined to become one of England's great statesmen. That same year, Alfred Tennyson was born. Tennyson was uh, an author who was born to an obscure minister and his wife who would turn the literary world upside down in his lifetime. He would uh, greatly impact his world. On the American continent in Cambridge, Massachusetts, a young baby was born named Oliver Wendell Holmes who would uh, end up transforming our legal system here in America. Just down the road in Boston, Massachusetts, that same year, just a few days later, a little baby was born. His name was Edgar Allan Poe. He lived an incredibly short life, a tragic life, and yet left his uh, mark in the world. And today, people still read the poetry and the short stories of that tragic author. In that same year, a physician whose name was Darwin had a little baby boy, and his child was named Charles Robert Darwin. And a little bit later on in that year, in a rugged um, little cabin in a town in Kentucky, was born a boy whose name was Abraham Lincoln. If you were living in 1809, the news broadcast, if they were broadcasting news back then, would have been filled with stories of uh, Napoleon's march. They would have been filled with stories of what was happening in England and America, but there wouldn't have been much made of the little babies who were being born in the cradles of England and America. But those births were as significant, if not more significant, than the events taking place that day. In a similar way, in the first century, the world was talking much about the events of the day. Taxation was on people's minds because a man named Caesar Augustus had declared that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. That required all of the citizens to go to their birthplaces to register, including a young man and a young woman named Joseph. And that young woman would bear birth to a baby. The biggest news of that time in the first century, the birth of a savior, news that would transform the world and yet news that for the most part was largely ignored. Yes, Jesus Christ is the reason we celebrate tonight. He's the reason you're here on this evening. And I want to uh, just take a moment to show you a video that has been a blessing to me this Christmas season and maybe get us thinking a little bit more about what Christmas is all about.
Christmas, but Jesus does. He knows exactly what's going on in your life, and he loves you with a love that will never end. He sent, uh, God the Father sent his son, Jesus Christ, so no matter whether you have hope or not this Christmas, that, uh, that you could find love, that you could find uh, meaning for life, that you could find somebody who, who would meet you right where you're at, know exactly who you are, know all of your scars, know all of the things that you struggle with, and, and despite all of that, uh, come with a love that is a, a pure and a never-ending love. Throughout this Christmas season here at Woodbury Community Church, we've been taking a look at what the meaning of Christmas really is all about. I mean, we know it's about Jesus. We know that Jesus came to earth as a baby, and he came with a great purpose for us. But uh, there's lots of reasons in the New Testament that Jesus himself said that he came. And so we thought, well, let's take some time over these four weeks leading into Christmas Eve and then on Christmas Eve night to take a look at some of the reasons that Jesus said that he came. And so the last four weeks, we've looked at things like where Jesus said in the New Testament, hey, I've come that you might have life and you might have it to the full. And that's a description of life that Jesus says he wants every one of us to experience, this joy that can only come in him. And we kind of fleshed out, what does that mean? He said he came to fulfill the law and the prophets. And what does that mean to somebody living in the 21st century? We, we, we dug deep in that. We talked about the fact that Jesus Christ came here as our servant king. He talks about that throughout the New Testament. When I think about kings and presidents and rulers, I think of people who, who rule. I don't typically think of people who come to serve. And yet that's the experience uh, that comes with Jesus. Jesus Christ came to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And then he, we, we talked about the fact this past Sunday that Jesus said that he came to willingly submit himself to the will of the Father, which was a will that meant that he would be born in a manger, but he would be born in the shadow of a cross. And that he would come here and he'd live a perfect life and he would die in our place. Well, tonight we're going to take a look at one more reason that Jesus said that he came. And it's a story that's found in the Gospel of Luke, where we find so much of the Christmas story. Um, but it's not the Christmas passage. It's actually in Luke 19. And it's a passage that many of us wouldn't ever associate with Christmas. It's a story that some of you heard when you were growing up in church. If you grew up in a church that had a Sunday school as a little kid, you may have even learned a song that went along with this story. It's found in Luke 19. It's the story of Zacchaeus. You know the story and the song about Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. Anybody remember that story from Sunday school years? He climbed up in a sycamore tree, the Lord he wanted to see, and the Savior came that way, and he looked up in the tree, and he said, Zacchaeus, you come, what did he say? Down from there, right? Because I'm coming to your house today, because I'm coming to your house today. Well, listen, in the first century, nobody would have sung that song. Nobody knew that song. It was a children's song that was made up in the past hundred years. Uh, in fact, nobody would have even wanted to, to, to talk much about this song because Zacchaeus wasn't really a good guy. And the, so, there's some kids here who are looking forward to Santa Claus coming. And um, there's, there's this thing that Santa does. And th there's a song about Santa Claus that says, he's keeping a list, he's checking it twice, he's going to find out who's what? Naughty or nice, okay? Well, guess what? Zacchaeus would have been on Santa's naughty list, okay? This guy was as bad as they came. And to the adults in the room, uh, let me put it in 21st century language, he was kind of organized crime of the first century. This is a guy who was a tax collector. Now, tax collectors worked in Israel for an occupying force. They worked for um, the Roman Empire. And they collected taxes for Rome, and they collected those taxes in a crooked way against the citizens of Israel. So these citizens of Israel worked very, very hard for their money. Tax collector could come and they would take a portion and Rome demanded a certain portion be given to the, the, the nation of Rome. And then they told the tax collectors, I'll tell you what, as long as you get us our cut, you go ahead and collect a little bit extra for yourself. And we'll look the other way. In fact, collect as much extra as you can. You can extort these people. You can take as much as you want that you're able to collect from people. And so that was organized crime. Now, the Bible says this guy wasn't just a tax collector. He was the boss of the tax collectors. He was the chief tax collector. So he was kind of like a mob boss. He was like the Don of his area. And uh, when Jesus was coming into town in Luke 19, this organized crime tax collector wanted to meet Jesus. 
He'd heard about Jesus. Jesus was kind of a big deal at this point in his life. He was a really big deal at this point in his life. Everybody wanted a piece of him. They'd heard about the miracles. They'd heard about the uh, stories where Jesus raised people from the dead, where he helped the, the lame to walk, the blind to see, where he'd feed people with just a few fish and loaves. And everybody wanted to see him. And Zacchaeus was no exception. So the story's found in Luke 19, and here's what it says. He entered Jericho and was passing through. That's talking about Jesus. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was. But on account of the crowd, he could not because he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead, and he climbed up in a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and he said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. He's, he has gone to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, behold, Lord, half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I've defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house since he is also a son of Abraham, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save those who are lost. I know it's Christmas Eve, and you've got a lot of plans tonight. So we're not going to go in depth in this story. But I want to talk real briefly about verse 10. Because it's one of those reasons that Jesus said that he came into this world. When Jesus was pressed time and time again about why he came, he'd give these reasons. And here he says that he came to seek and to save those who are lost. My question for you on this Christmas Eve is, could that be a description of you tonight? If you were honest about the state of your spiritual condition, would you say that I'm somebody who's a, a spiritual seeker? I'm somebody who has basically taken God and put him to the side in my life as something that's not important. He's not a priority. He's just, maybe he's there, maybe he's not. Or would you say, no, you know what? I, I know that Jesus is who he said that he was. I think most of us have been lost at some point in our life. Some of us get lost a little more often than others. This year, Woodbury Community Church gave me an incredible gift as their pastor. They let me take a three-month sabbatical. It's something every seven years they let the pastor do here. And so this year, I had an opportunity to travel to churches all over the country and kind of learn from them and see what God is, is doing around the country. And I called a lot of old friends, and I said, hey, I have an opportunity to visit some churches. I'd love to visit your church. I've heard great things about what's going on. And one of those churches was in a place I had never visited, hardly knew a thing about. It was Finley, Ohio. Here's what I knew about Finley, Ohio. It was close to Toledo. Problem was, I'd never been to Toledo, Ohio. But I live in the 21st century, which is a wonderful thing. It means that I have an iPhone like many of you. And on my iPhone, all I have to do is plug in an address, and Siri will tell me how to get there. And so on this particular trip, I asked the youth pastor who I was staying with, can you text me your address? He said, sure, happy to do it. And, uh, and I put it on my phone, and I left my home in Minnesota, and I was just going to drive straight through that day to Ohio. And I thought the trip was going to take me about 10 hours and about 11 hours into it. I realized I still had two or three more hours to go that night and it had become a very long day. Now take a look at the map. And when I put the, um, when I put the, the, the specs in my phone, my, my phone said that it were going to take me to his home and his home was in Warren, Ohio. And I just thought, well, Warren must be a, a suburb of Finley, you know, that huge metropolis of Finley, Ohio, which is just south of Toledo up here, about uh, 20, 30 miles. Well, Finley is nowhere near Warren, Ohio. Finley is on the western part of Ohio. Warren is almost in Pennsylvania, on the other side of the state, toward the northern part of the state. I drove 176 miles too far that night, which tells you a couple things. Number one, I'm an idiot, all right? I should have looked at a map. I should have, should have paid some attention, should have at least checked it out. But I trust Siri. All right, number two, it tells you this. Make sure you're following the right map. Some of us in our life think, hey, we've got life figured out. I know where I'm going. I know where I'm headed when I die. I know everything that I need to know to live the life that I need to live. And we're going to be shocked at the end of, the, the end of our lives to find out that all this time we've been following the wrong map. And we're going to end up in a destination that isn't going to lead us to God. It's going to lead us in the opposite direction. Zacchaeus had been following a map for most of his life that made his life pretty cushy. 
I mean, he was rich, was the description the Bible gives of him. He had some stature, even though it meant that he had to walk over a few people to get there. He was pretty secure in his life. When he met Christ, he found out just how lost that he was. Jesus Christ said that he came to seek and to save those who are lost. Zacchaeus is a, somebody like that. And guess what? So am I and so are you without Christ. Every one of us needs to recognize that this statement about Jesus is a statement for people like us. That Jesus Christ came to earth because he loved us. So let's go back to the Christmas story. Matthew 1, it's version of the Christmas story where a young man named Joseph who's been living a really righteous life. He's a great guy. He's a, he's a godly man. In his generation, he's one of those people that people in the community would have looked up to. Joseph found himself in a dilemma in Matthew chapter 1. He was engaged. He was promised, betrothed to be married to a woman named Mary. And this is how it says it in verses 18 to 21. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. That's why Jesus came. He came to save those who were lost. He came to seek and to save those who were lost. Is that a description of you tonight? Are you feeling lost? Are you spiritually lost? The good news is that's what this holiday is about. A God who comes to save. Paul Harvey was one of my favorite broadcasters when he lived. I remember driving to school, and every day Paul Harvey's voice would come over the, the radio as my dad would be driving us on the Chicago station WGN. And his, his show was on stations all over the country. He was that famous broadcaster who would tell these stories, kind of tell the rest of the story. And he'd end his day with Paul Harvey, good day. I mean, we loved Paul Harvey. Paul Harvey has a great story that he used to tell at Christmas time. It's about a family, a family that some of the people in the family believed that Jesus was who he said that he was, but the father, the father was a little bit stubborn. In fact, uh, this is how he tells the story. He says, the man who I'm going to introduce you to was not a Scrooge. He was a kind and decent and mostly good man, generous to his family, upright in his dealings with other men, but he just didn't believe all that incarnation stuff, which churches proclaim at Christmas time. It just didn't make sense to him. He, he was too honest to pretend otherwise. He just couldn't swallow that Jesus Christ had come to earth as the Son of God in the form of a man. I'm truly sorry to distress you, he told his wife, but I'm not going to church with you this Christmas Eve, he said. He said he'd just feel like a hypocrite if he did, that he'd much rather just stay home and read the paper. He said, you go, you go, I'll, I'll wait up for you and when you come back, we can celebrate a little more. And so his family left for the midnight service at their local church. Shortly after the family drove away in the car, he went to the big picture window of his house, and he looked outside at the snow as it was falling. He looked at the light that was on in his garage, and eventually he made his way away from the window, and he sat down on his favorite chair, and he began to read his favorite paper. And then he heard the sound. It startled him at first as he heard the sound of one bird hitting the window and then another bird hitting the window and another bird hitting his big picture window on that very cold night. The birds had seen the warm light coming out of the big picture window and they thought maybe that was a place where they could find shelter on that cold night only to find themselves stunned as they hit their heads on the little window of the house. Well, this man wasn't a tyrant, he was a good man. He felt bad for the birds. And he thought, if only those birds could find their way into the, the, the barn where my children keep their horse, they'd find a barn that was warm and a barn that would provide safe shelter and a barn where they'd be able to wait out the storm. And so he put his coat on and he put some boots on and he made his way to the barn where there was some bird seed and he got some bird seed and he went to the spot outside the picture window where the birds were now laying and the on the snow. He thought, I'll coax him into the barn. And so he put some bird seed and made a little trail and none of the birds would follow. Every time he'd get near the birds, they'd squawk, but they had been stunned and 
And, uh, and so he'd try to reach down and maybe pick up a bird. And, and even as he tried to pick up the birds, they'd have just enough energy to work their way away from him. There was nothing that he could do to get these birds to follow him. And so he continued to say, what, what can I do to, to, to help these birds? And he tried everything. He tried to speak to them, but he couldn't speak. He tried waving his arms, and they'd just scatter in every single direction. Then he realized that they were afraid of him. He reasoned, I'm strange. I'm a terrifying creature to them. If only I could think of some way to let them know that they can trust me. I'm not trying to hurt them. I'm trying to help them. But how? Because any move that he made would just frighten them and confuse them more. They just wouldn't follow. They wouldn't be led or shooed because they feared him. He thought, if only I could be a bird. If only I could be a bird, he thought. Then I could mingle with them and I could speak their language. I could tell them not to be afraid. I could show them how to be safe and how to be warm. And I could show them the way to this safe and warm barn where they're going to be fine. But I'd have to be one of them so they could see and they could understand. It was about that moment that the bells in the church began to ring. The bells played that famous Christmas carol, O come, all ye faithful, joyful, and triumphant. O come ye, O come ye, to Bethlehem. And as he listened to the bells, and as he thought about what he had just been reasoning to himself, that if only he could be one of them, he sank, and his knees went in the snow, and he said, God, that's what you did, isn't it? Oh, God, I misunderstood. Oh, God, I misunderstood. And Paul Harvey, in his beautiful voice, said, would say at the end of his show, I hope you and those you love that this will be a wonderful Merry Christmas, that you'll know this God who came to earth in the form of a man because people like us needed to be rescued. He came to seek and to save those who were lost. What's the description of your heart on this Christmas Eve? The Bible's most famous verse is John 3, 16. The verse after, it's beautiful too. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved or in order that the world might be saved through him. That same God, that same Jesus said in John 10, 11, right after he said, I've come that you might have life and have it to the full, he said, he said this in the next verse, I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. This Christmas Eve, may you know him. This Christmas Eve, may you celebrate Jesus, the one who loved you enough to come here as a human being and take the spot that you and I deserve to be on a cross, bore our sins so that we could be forever reconciled to God. Listen, if you've never trusted Jesus as your Savior, let me tell you the greatest gift you could give God. The greatest gift you could give God this Christmas Eve would be to say, God, take me. I'm yours. God, I believe you are who you said that you were. Give him your fears. Give him your intellect. Give him all of those arguments that maybe you've tried to make over the years. And say, Jesus... No more running. Jesus, I'm yours. If you'd like to do that, we want to pray this prayer together, and then we're going to invite our worship team to come and close us in a couple more songs as we light um, the candles from the Christ candle. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you that you are good, that your love endures forever. God, thank you that you see us just the way that we are, and you love us. Lord, there's nothing that we'll ever be able to do for you that's going to make you love us more than you do right now. God, I thank you that you don't expect us to be perfect. That, God, that you don't expect us to be um, something that, that, that we can't be on our own. That, God, you sent your son, Jesus, to do for us what we couldn't do ourselves. That he died in our place, taking our sin upon himself at the cross so that we could be reconciled to God. And so today, God, I tell you, I'm done running. Today, I ask you on this Christmas Eve to forgive me of my sins. Today, I recognize that I need a Savior. Lord, that I, I need you. Sure, I'm better than maybe some people on this earth, but I'm not you, God. I can't possibly meet the standard that can only be made met in Jesus Christ. 
So Jesus, I, I trust you. Jesus, I give you me. Jesus, I declare that I, I believe that you are the Son of God who came at Christmas time, lived a perfect life, and died in my place on a cross. Give me the courage to live for you and my generation. God, become not only my Savior, but my Lord. From this day forward, let my priorities be your priorities. Let your priorities be my priorities. God, help me to be somebody who, who lives for you and your glory and your renown. In Jesus' name, amen. So if you prayed that prayer tonight, Jesus Christ has started something new in your life. He is your Savior and he's your Lord. And share that with somebody this Christmas season. So every Sunday of Advent, we have lit one of the Advent candles. The four candles each lit on the Sundays preceding uh, tonight, and then tonight, the Christ candle. Advent literally means that we are waiting for Christ's arrival. And each week, a candle is lit to represent Christ coming into the world. He calls himself the light of the world. But you know, Jesus didn't just say, I am the light of the world. He told his followers, you're the light of the world too. And when he left, he said, you're going to be my ambassadors. You're going to represent me. As we light this candle from the Christ candle, and then this candle lights two more candles, and those candles light more candles, the room will continue to grow brighter. That represents our responsibility as ambassadors of Jesus Christ to shine for him in this generation. And so we're going to sing uh, a song together. The candles will be lit as we sing this song. And then we're going to sing Joy to the World, and the worship team will give you some instructions on how and when to extinguish your candle. <laughs> Oh, you've come to bring peace, to be loved, to be nearer to us. Oh, you've come to bring life, to be light, to shine brighter in us. Oh, Emmanuel. deliverer you are savior in your presence we find our strength over everything our redemption God with us you are God with us oh you've come the grave, O oh, Emmanuel, God with us, our Deliverer, you are Savior, in your presence we find our strength, over everything, our redemption, God. With us, you are God with us. You are here, you are holy. We are standing in your glory. You are here, you are holy. We are standing in your glory. You are here, you are holy, we are standing in your glory. You are here, you are holy, we are standing in your glory, Lord. Our Deliverer, you are Savior. In your presence we find our strength Over everything our redemption God with us You are God with us Amen You may 
might stand with us and sing Joy to the World. And as you stand, you may blow out your candles. the joy that comes in Christ Jesus. May you celebrate with love with those around you, and may you experience his grace throughout the year. Amen. Away in a manger, no crib for a bed, the little Lord Jesus lay down sweet head the stars in the sky look down where he lay the little lord jesus asleep on the hay 